Good morning again. Hey, my name is Tommy, one of the pastors here. Uh, we'll continue our sermon th series through the book of Psalms. Uh, speaking of uh, missions, you know, far away, we also have to do that here as well. So even in our own backyard. Hey, if you were at the car show yesterday, just raise your hand. Were you at the car show? We had a lot of people there. Would you all do me a favor? Please thank those people that made that happen. There were people cooking all night, working all night, serving all night. <laughs> So just know that when you give money to our church, it's literally being used here in our backyard to Cleveland. It's going to be going to Guatemala, literally all around the world. And so we're looking for 40 churches, 40 cent. We, we love the idea that we're a mission-minded church, and we want you to go. So all we're doing is asking the question, hey, what's God asking you to do? Backyard, Cleveland, Guatemala, take your pick. Maybe help get someone there. But just at least ask yourself the question, what is God asking me to be a part of his plan as we reach people for the kingdom of God. Hey, today we're going to be in Psalm 107. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and open that up. Psalm 107. If you don't have a Bible, there may be one underneath you there, under there. But I want you to kind of circle right in it, maybe write some names as we write, read through the Psalm 107 today. But as you get in there, I do want to tell you a story about a couple, uh, a couple that uh, the guy was not doing really well. He was in poor health. It wasn't going well. And they see the wife took him to the doctor. You know, they ran all the tests. Uh, did all those kind of things. They came back for the visit to find out, well, what the diagnosis was, what's going on with this, this man who's not doing well. And when they actually sit down with the doctor, the guy said, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. And literally he left the room. And so the doctor said, hey, that's actually a good thing. I need to talk to your wife just alone. So he starts to, to tell the wife, says, listen, this thing, we can turn this around. We can do this, but a lot's going to fall on you. Let me just give you a few things I think can help you as you help your husband said, first of all, it's really important that your husband has a really good breakfast in the morning. It's just going to help him out if you just make a breakfast for him and, and feed him in the morning. That's going to be really good. I know he's still going to work, so as he goes to work, he doesn't need to be eating now. If you would, just can you pack his lunch for him and maybe put some love notes in there? It's a lot of encouragement that's going to help this situation. The doctor kept going and said, now I know this sounds like a lot, but I would not go out to eat at restaurants. You really need to have some home-cooked meals. So do your best to cook his favorite meals and take care of him. And now this may be too much, but if you really want to see him turn around, you could probably rub his feet every night. Just give him a good foot massage. It's really going to make a difference in his life. Even at night, if you want to just rub his shoulders and yes, I'm going to say it, just whatever his needs are, if you'll just meet those needs, if you'll do this for the next six months, I'm telling you, your husband's going to be in much better shape. I think he can beat this situation. Of course, at that time, the husband comes back in and the wife says, come on, honey, let's go. We're leaving. And they go get in the car, and the guy's like, well, I want to know, what did the doctor say? Well, the wife, you know, she put her hand on her husband and said, honey, the doctor said, you're going to die. <laughs> now, I know that in our family, we think that we love someone, and we can love them unconditionally no matter what. But let's be reminded that we are human, and all of us have limits to our love that we can show someone else. Right? There's eventually a limit when we say, I can't go that far. I love you, but I don't know that I can do that. Fortunately, our God has no limits for his love for us. Right? God doesn't look and say, I'm sick of loving that person. They just won't listen, right? Can't do it anymore. No, God says, I love you no matter what you do to me. I love you because you're my child. In Psalm 107, we're going to read about how God is in the business of rescuing his people and bringing his children back to him. The last two weeks, we went to two events that were kind of gave me a taste of Psalm 107. Uh, a week ago, Sunday after church, we went to a neighborhood birthday party. Lady on our street turned 95. And the interesting thing about our street is everybody on our street knows this lady. Now, we don't know all know each other. We're trying. But this lady pretty much knows the whole street and sent out invitations. And it was kind of cool to go to a birthday party on your neighborhood, about 25 people there. And we just sat down, had lunch, had fellowship for a couple hours, and that was a lot of fun. You know, some I knew, some I didn't know, getting to know some people, and I like that. I like that mingling of neighbors and getting to know people. Well, we had another event last past week, uh, a few days ago. We went down to the Civic Center, and instead of 25, there were 1,200 people at this event. It was the Women's Pregnancy Center, uh, their banquet, and Mike Pence was the speaker, and a lot of you were there. I had a lot of people from my church who were there representing. And one of the coolest things about that event was as I walked around the room, because that's what I do, right? Walk around the room, about every other table, I see somebody I know. Oh, they're from that church. Oh, well, there's their staff. 
Oh, I know that guy from basketball. Oh, I know you guys from that other ministry. And just seeing people that I knew, just really cool. As I think about these two events, it's kind of like a little slice of heaven. When you get to heaven and you finally just get to sit down and just enjoy the fellowship with people that you know and love in your world. This is what Psalm 107 is. Psalm 107 comes at the time when God gathers his people and when they've all been rescued from something. And they get to spend time together in fellowship for eternity. Let's begin. Psalm 107. I'm going to read the first few verses or intro here. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Stop there. You don't have to wait till God gives you money to say thank you. You don't have to wait till you get good health to say thank you. Matter of fact, we don't even say thank you, God, for what he does for us. We thank you, God, because he is good, because he is holy, and we are his children. It says, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. The history of Israel has experienced a little bit of everything. They've wandered in the desert. They've been exiles. They've been in bondage. They've been prisoners. And in Psalm 107, you see these four pictures of how God has continually brought his people, rescued them back to him no matter what they did. His love says, I'm going to love you no matter what you do, and I desire that all men come back to me and be rescued. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your word. Just a few minutes we have to walk through Psalm 107. We've been taking a journey each week through the book, and Lord, we've realized that, man, we can worship you no matter what our circumstances are. We can still cry out and say, God, thank you for your goodness to us. So today, Father, help us to realize that you're still in the business of rescuing those who are lost and bringing them to yourself to be your children. Thank you, Father, for your name we pray. And everybody said? All right, let's look at these four pictures real quick as you walk through Psalm 107. The first one is going to be called the Wanderer. The wanderer. Now, all of them have this pattern. It's somebody in need, right? We all have a need, and the need could be great. And then we cry out, God, I need help. Please come on, Lord. I'm, I'm, it's me. It's my turn. Would you please come and rescue me? God hears that cry, and God rescues his people. And then, and added something to Psalm 107, is they stop and they give thanks. Listen, if you're redeemed, in other words, you're a believer in Christ, your sins have been forgiven, you should be very thankful. What we're going to do this morning is every time I read that little line that says, let the redeemed or the Lord say so, you're just going to say amen. And if you've been redeemed and you feel it, you can say it as loud as you want. All right, let's try it. Let the redeemed or the Lord say so. Amen. We're going to do that this morning as we walk through these four pictures and see if you find yourself in one of these four situations or probably also a loved one that's in one of these four as well. The first one, the wanderer. This is what it says. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfeeling love and his wonderful deeds for mankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Maybe that's your story. Maybe in your life you were the wanderer. Maybe you spent some years trying to figure out what this life was about. And you can understand what it says, man, I was lost trying this, going there, city to city, thing to thing. And until I met Christ, I didn't even know what I was missing. Or maybe it's somebody in your family. Maybe you know somebody right now, they're still wondering, are they ever going to find their way? Is God going to rescue them? Man, if I'm right inside of my Bible, I just write their name right down. I'm still praying for my child, my cousin, my family member, my loved one. God, bring the wanderers home. You know, my family, we got to witness this. I had an older sister who for about four or five years kind of went off the deep, you know, quit high school, ran away, tried a little bit of everything, spent some time in prison. Had three kids, came back, and now she's settled down. And for decades now, she's got to raise her boys, and they now have children. But there was a period in her life where we kind of wondered, what's going to happen with this family member? Hey, maybe that's you. 
Maybe you know someone, and I'm asking you, don't give up hope because God is still in the business of rescuing the wanderer. The next one we come to is called the prisoner, verses 10 through 16. It says, Some set in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and they despised the plans of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind, for he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in prison, but it's not talking about just prison with bars. It's talking about also things that actually ensnare you, that enslaved you, an addiction, something that's got you that you literally feel like I'm a prisoner to this thing and it's got me. God says, no, I'm still in the business for those who will cry out. I will hear your cry. I will come rescue you and I will give you new life. The next picture we come to is the sick. Now, again, not just illness like we think of, it's choices they have made that they're just really bad off. Their health is gone. You know, think about in my family, I've personally seen alcohol and how alcoholism, you know, can destroy someone where they don't even want to live anymore. And you talk about drugs and so many other things where people just made a bad choice that led to another bad choice. And pretty soon they're so sick, it says they don't even want to live anymore. This is what it says about the sick in verse 17. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. It's their actions that led them to get to this point. It says they loathed all food. They didn't want to eat, and they drew near the gates of death. I don't even want to live. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Now, I don't know if that's your story. It could be. But everybody here right now is probably thinking of a person in their mind. That's exactly where they're at. Because of the choices they've made and what they've done to their body, even their mental state, they're in such a place now that they're just sick and they need help, they need rescued. And God says, man, I'm in the business of doing this. The wanderer, the prisoner, the sick, I'm in the business of bringing people to restore them to relationship with Christ. And God says, that's what I'm doing for my children. Then we come to the last one, the fourth one. This is the one that's no fun because I've got a picture of this one in my life. This is called the lost at sea. You ever been seasick? Not a lot of fun, right? So when I lived in San Diego for about a year, I got a chance to go out on a boat in the ocean, and I learned my lesson. If they don't call it a cruise boat, I'm not getting on it. If it's a little bitty thing, and it's going out a big ocean, I don't want to get on that little bitty boat, because I know what happens if I get on that little bitty boat. So we had a group. We were going to go out and watch America's Cup, the race. It's about four, a little over four hours. And I said, sure, I'll go. I'd never been out in the ocean, you know, in a small boat like this. And we took about a 30-minute ride to get out to where we were going. And in that 30 minutes, I'm pretty sure I had thrown up everything I'd ever eaten the last month. I was sick as a dog. And we were just getting started. I'm thinking, great, I am stuck in this boat for about three and a half more hours, and I don't even know if I'm going to make it. Even though they parked the thing, right? We're just watching it. It still does this. The waves are coming. Hey, go inside and lay down. Yeah, that doesn't work. Still throwing up inside. Sorry about that, boat owner. He said, once you go outside, don't look at the you know, water. Look up across the horizon. Just try to get level. It didn't work. I'm telling you, for about four hours, I literally thought I was going to die. I was that sick. They didn't, I was like, you got a shot, a patch, give me something. Nobody had anything. I thought, you know what, I'd rather jump off this boat than to stay in this boat and put up with this anymore because I was just losing it. When we got in, man, I'm telling you, I did kiss the stinking ground. All right, I was that bad off. And I told myself, self, don't ever do that again. Don't ever get on a little bitty boat and go out in the ocean. So if it's not a cruise boat, I'm not interested in going deep sea fishing with you, all right? Because I know that I can't handle it. I just can't take it. My body, my makeup, I can't even do roller coasters anymore. It's that bad. As we read about the lost at sea, this is what it's like when people go through storms in their life. It says this in verse 23. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. 
They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest. Here comes a storm that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths in their peril. Their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits end. They literally thought they were going to die. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed, and they were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. I don't know. Maybe this is you. I got a buddy right now, a guy I know who lives a few states away and known him for years. Recently, just the last couple of weeks, his wife, out of the blue it seemed, took the two kids and left. Said, I'm done. Don't follow me. Don't want to be with you. It's over. He calls me about every other day. We've talked on the phone for hours the last few weeks. And I can literally feel the pain as he tells the story about what's happening. And he's in the middle of the storm. He's literally describing, I'm on this boat. The waves keep crashing and I don't know if it's going to end. Maybe that's your story. Maybe in your family, you've had some pretty big storms. Maybe a relationship that split. Maybe children that said, forget you. Maybe just a friend that you thought was a friend and now you're in the middle of a storm and the waves are crashing, the wind is blowing and you think, is this ever going to end? Is there an end to this storm in my life? I love the fact that God says, you know what? If you cry out, I will hear your cry and I will rescue you, even if you're lost at sea in the middle of a storm. Then we come to the conclusion of this psalm. And it's basically telling us that God is in control on good days and he's also in control of bad days. He doesn't go anywhere. He's still on the throne and he's the one that decides, if you will, when you cry out that I love you, I will rescue you. I'm waiting to hear you call for me. This is what it says in verse 33 to 42. He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste. Because of the wickedness of those who live there, he turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased and he did not let their herds diminish. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste. But he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. I love this. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked will shut their mouths. You know, we live in a world that says sometimes there is no God, it's not worth it, that religion thing's a crutch. You know, where's your God now? And people just curse in the name of God and, you know, saying, God, when? When will you make all this right? God says, in my timing, I will shut the mouths of the wicked. There'll be no more taking my name in vain. There'll be no more cursing who I am. There'll be no more making up your own morals because God's way says my way, and in the end, it's my way. But God says right now that we need to see and rejoice. Now that was great for the children of Israel, right? That's the Old Testament Psalms talking about all that stuff they've been through, the exile, the wandering, the, the prisoner, the bondage. Well, what about you and I? I mean, does God still do this stuff? Is it still happening today? Can we see Jesus in Psalm 107? Here's how you see Jesus in Psalm 107. Look at these four situations. Number one, the wanderer. Jesus says, you know what? I'm still seeking the lost. That family member of yours that's out there wandering around, I'm, I'm, I love them more than you do. I desire that all men come to me. Remember Luke chapter 15 tells us those three stories? One's about a woman who lost a coin. I mean, she lost a coin. What does she do? Turn her house upside down trying to find the coin. And when she finds it, she throws a party. Another story about the guy and the, the sheep. Remember he had like a hundred, right? 
He only lost one. But what's he do? He leaves that 99 and he goes and finds the one. And when he finds it, he throws a party. The third story in that Luke 15 is about the prodigal son. Right? For a lot of families, this is hitting home because you know, we've been there. Or maybe you were that child that said, you know what, God, I don't need you. I'll go do my own thing. End of the story is the good news is that he cried out. He came back. God rescued him. In that story, God gives us hope that God is still in the business of seeking the lost and finding the wanderers. How about the prisoner? God care about those in prison and those in bondage? He says, you know what? I do. Jesus says, I came to set the captives free. I want to give you new life, life abundant. How about the sick? God still take care of the sick? You know what he does? He says, you know what? I came to heal the sick. Not just power over illness, but power over your mental state, your spiritual state. I can change your life. What about the lost at sea? Can Jesus calm the sea? Ask the disciples that were in the boat, right? Storm's coming. They think they're going to die. They're thinking, let's jump over. It's over. What does Jesus do? He stands up, he rebukes the waves and the wind, and the storm calms. Jesus is still in the business of calming the storms of your life. As a matter of fact, he is the only one that can do that. So until people cry out, realize that I have a need, and God hears them, they can't be rescued. Psalm 107 is a great picture of bringing people literally from all walks of life, no matter your background, all together, and to say, you know what? I love all of you people. I don't care how messed up you are. I don't care how messed up your friend is, your family member. I love you just as much as I love others. And as we get to the conclusion, we think, okay, well, what's my homework? What's my takeaway here? This is the last verse in Psalm 107. It says this, let the one who is wise, if you've got a brain in your head, if you can understand what it's saying, please listen. Let the one who is wise heed these things and ponder the loving deeds of of the Lord. So my homework from here is simply heed the gospel. Heed means to stop and consider and make the right choice. It's like, listen, you've been told the truth. If you want to stay wondering, if you want to stay in prison, you want to keep yourself sick, if you want to be in the storms of life with no hope, then you just don't listen to the gospel. You just don't listen to God's word. And you can stay right there and do whatever you want. But if you want to be rescued, he says, would you please stop and just heed the gospel? I understand that's why I made you I am your God, and I would love nothing more to rescue you, and you can be my child as well. I think sometimes, even in church, though we, uh, we judge people, we don't mean to. we just just who we are, human nature, right? So I've got these three ropes that kind of remind me of this. We've got uh, sometimes we literally look at people and we say, oh, they're small, maybe insignificant, right? That's small. Then we got, uh, we got medium here. we got medium. That's just your average person. Oh, look at this guy. He's important. That's the big guy, right? He's important. Or even we view their life like, can God really save that person? Look how much they've done. Does God really want this person in heaven? See, I, I think what happens is in our hands, we see three different lengths of rope. And that's the kind of way we view life sometimes is that does God really care for the homeless guy like he cares for me? What about the murderer and the thief? Does God really care for them like he cares for those church-going people? You know, sometimes, though, and we don't get careful, these ropes in God's hands, what he's trying to say is, I don't care if you're small, you're medium, or you're large. When God looks at these, he actually sees all these the same length. And that's God is telling us, I need you not to judge people. Think that there's different levels of sin and different levels of lostness. You're all lost, people. We're all lost, saved by the grace of God. When God looks at us, he literally sees all three ropes the same length. So it doesn't matter if you got one rope here, you got two ropes, and we got three ropes. He literally sees all these ropes the same length. And that's what he's asking us to do as we read Psalm 107. Guys, don't get caught up thinking that, you know, some people are small and insignificant. And some people, are maybe their, their sin is too great. They can never come back to the Lord. No, God says this, you're all my children. And at the foot of the cross, we're all level. It's all the same. We've all been saved by his grace. What he's asking us today from Psalm 107 is, listen, if you have been changed by the blood of Christ, would you please let the redeemed of the Lord say so? Amen. There are people out there who need to say amen as well. So whether it's in the backyard here with the car show, whether it's going to Cleveland, whether it's going to Guatemala or another international trip, all we're asking as we think about 40 churches and 40 cent is what's your part in that? 
Will you continue to pray for those family members and those ones who are wondering, those who are literally in prison because of their bondage, those who are sick because of bad choices they made, and yes, those who are going through storms right now. Man, he's asking, as the children of God, would you please help them to cry out? God loves them just as much as he loves us, and God would love nothing more to continue to rescue his people and bring them home to eternity with him. Let's pray together. Father, I am thankful that if we would just simply understand nobody is more deserving than anybody else. Lord, the fact is we are all lost. At one time we were in sin, and when you brought us to understand what it means to be saved through Jesus Christ, Lord, we ought to be thankful people. We ought to be walking around saying amen all the time. And I don't have to wait till you put money in my bank account until you give me a house. I can do that right now because you are good, you are holy, and you love me. So thank you. Help us to be a thankful people. But Father, also, every one of us here, maybe we're thinking about somebody who right now is in one of these situations. I pray we don't give up. Lord, I pray that we keep praying on their behalf. And Lord, if they come back, I pray we throw a gigantic party that we celebrate because God is still in the business of rescuing people. Lord, there may be somebody listening right now who says, you know, that's me. I, I've been wondering, I, I've been on my own and I'm in a storm and God, I don't know if I have another day. Lord, they need to cry out to you and realize that you are their only hope. Salvation through Jesus Christ, that's our only hope. Father, I pray that today is the day they make that decision. And Lord, then we'll leave here. We've got to leave this day without understanding, God, that you have done that for them. You've done it for all. People from literally every walk of life, you invite and say, I desire that all men will come to know my son Jesus and spend eternity with me. Thank you, Lord, for your name we pray. And everybody said,